Good morning, St. Peter's, in person and online. Pray with me, God, creator, redeemer, sustainer, draw near now, amen. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him for power came out from him and healed all of them. We've heard lots of preaching on the blessings and woes. Jesus's directed instruction and challenge the blessing and warning of the many disciples and crowd at large, perhaps that great catch of people he told Simon about. Jesus is among a diverse group. They are young and old, rich and poor from far and near. Yet it is the great equalizer, physical and spiritual disease that has drawn many, if not most of them, to the plane that day. Remember, it's Jesus's reputation as a miracle worker that draws and makes believers out of most of them. And so they've come. They've come for the experience of Jesus, Jesus, the physical and spiritual healer. They've come to experience his power, and they do. The people come and the people get what they need. So when he speaks that day, Jesus has a receptive audience. The mood is right. And this is what he has to say. Jesus calls us to see, to see in poverty and great need, a blessing. And warns us about the challenges that come with wealth and privilege. To it, he declares, woe. Ouch, but there it is. In this season of epiphany, this time of God spotting, looking for the light, today we are given Jesus, revealed to us as the Christ who calls us to know in poverty a blessing, to know the complexity of privilege. It is a challenge for sure, and we have to hear it. This calling back to surrender when we've acquired so much, a unique opportunity to side like Jesus with the poor to use our resources and connections to make a tangible difference in the lives of those less fortunate, to be the hands and feet behind that dream Mary sang about in her Magnificat just a few chapters back, when she sang of the low being lifted up and the hungry fed. What Jesus is talking about here is that level plane the text describes. Jesus walks out to be with and among the people, rejecting the status quo, dismantling systems, disrupting the normalization of injustice, saying no to the way things have been. Jesus comes to right the wrongs. The Beatitudes, the blessings are Jesus's exhortation of God's intention of good for us. The woes are a warning about wealth as an idol and all that stuff we have, stuff that creates a sense of self-satisfaction and so easily separates us from God. God will be the God of those who have nothing but him. All others will struggle with the competing gods present in a life of ease. For them, a life of surrender will be hard. He says nothing is everything and everything can be a problem. And the truth of that unlearning Jesus said will be hardest for the privileged and wealthy. And that's most of us in this room. And yet, before we're to sit under any teaching, Jesus wants wholeness. He wants us to be whole. Jesus enters into the present suffering of all gathered, the people pressing in, on, and around him, and his power, the power coming from him, is a corrective to anything that is wrong. This is an image of what is beautifully articulated as the whole gospel for whole persons, for the whole world. 
And the entire text is a challenge for all of us, the disciples of Christ, to participate in the reshaping, the reorientation of the world, to make the dream of God a reality. But today, it begins here with healing. So I want to dive deeper into the blessings and woes, but I'm not sure I'll have time. Today, I'm drawn to the verses that come before them. I read the text and can't get past the part that tells of this power, an inherent power, one that resides in Jesus by virtue of his nature, a power he exerts that emanates from him to heal all present and in need. Jesus wants the people whole. What do we say and believe about this kind of power? What, if anything, do we believe about healing? What does it mean to be healed? Can we be made whole? In a world rife with the after effects, the communal and personal trauma of a global pandemic, the clear and present danger of a sickness we could not heal, the bodies seeking healing in parks and cathedrals, in convention centers, and to the piles of bodies we could not help, the millions of lives lost, the collective sense of post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, confusion, and anger from months of physical distancing from quarantine, the very real toll it took on our relationships, our mental, emotional, and spiritual health. All of this added to our usual cries for relief from sickness and disease, cancer, HIV and AIDS, autoimmune disorders, diabetes, Alzheimer's and dementia, the list goes on. What, O oh God of healing? What do we think about it? What do we do with a text that tells us about Jesus's power to heal and to heal in the moment? Do we believe like that anymore? Do we expect to experience the power of Jesus? Is that real for us at all? It seems we've long since lost faith in the hope of physical healing. It's not something we can promise, and our inability to predict keeps us quiet about it. We can hardly imagine energy as anything beyond the mood of a room, and take seriously no other power than our own. I think it fair to say we no longer expect any such displays of divine power. And yet, a Pew Research study suggests about a third of Americans believe in healing miracles. They believe in them or say they have experienced divine healings themselves. I am one of them. My faith journey began in a non-denominational church, as I've told you, with a very much Pentecostal bent. So reading about this scene brings to mind a typical Sunday service, the kind that happened any time we gathered. It feels familiar, the crowd pressing in on Jesus, making their way forward to participate in the exchange of power by bringing themselves, body, soul, and mind to the possibility of the healing moment. It's real for me. I see the people, I hear the murmuring, the voices, the tears and cries of desperation, of release and relief. I feel the energy and expectancy in the room. I know this power. It was present, activated, and working. In those moments, our expectation connected with the power of Jesus and healing happened. All kinds of healing, but healing happened. My memories take me to a packed music studio, complete with music stands and fold-up chairs pushed aside to make room for the many bodies in any and many arrays of postures, right? all in response to what they were experiencing. People were on their knees, jumping, leaping, shouting, crying, curled over in laughter. Those gathered know the truth of what I'm saying, and if you've experienced, you know it too. The power of God can be present. 
These days, I worry we talk ourselves out of its powerful possibility of healing. I think we do. We walk right over and past these words, dismissing them as the writings of some ancient but indecipherable code one will never understand, much less experience. But that isn't true. Healing is real. It's just so much more expansive than we imagined. So the words are here. They're part of the story and text for the day. So let's pause for a moment and listen in again. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him for power came out from him and healed all of them. They had come because of the potential for encounter with a power that flowed through and out of Jesus. They'd heard the stories. We've walked through them ourselves these past few weeks. So remember the miracle of water turned wine at Cana, right? These miracles, Jesus' bold proclamation as he read the scroll at Nazareth, where he said, and I'll steal Jimmy's line, I am the one. We heard about the great catch of fish granted to Simon as he moved toward a deeper level of trust in Jesus. The text says they had come and that they were healed. They had come because he was the one, the miracle worker, the Messiah, and they had come expectant. I have lived long enough to know that not every one of my dreams will come true. That some of my prayers will, in my limited understanding and way of seeing, will go unanswered. But I have also witnessed in my mind and my heart, and I even have a simple story of healing to tell. I have a story of healing to tell. So I want us to consider healing today. Maybe push aside our past experiences and disappointments to consider it afresh. The mysterious power to heal and how we might bring ourselves to it more fully, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. They had come implies curiosity. It says that the mystery or the possibility of absolutely nothing happening was real, but they would considered it not and gave it a shot anyhow. They showed up for the healing that would happen, whatever that looked like. Unfortunately, this usually requires a certain level of desperation. Remember, we named earlier the great equalizer of sickness and disease, the many ways we can know and experience brokenness. But they had come gathered in what would become a community, and communities require these stories. Our individual stories and journeys bring the fullness of life. In All About Love, the late Bell Hooks wrote, rarely, if ever, are any of us healed in isolation. Healing, she offers, is an act of communion centering the therapeutic and restorative power of community. So maybe we gather like this to fortify and strengthen our souls through this common experience and become for each other in community the healing that is needed, the shoulder to cry on, the hand to hold. And there is truth there. There is the truth of collective healing, the processing and working through the ways of coping shared by groups. There is the fact of the healing balm of our stories shared. The story of the long haul, the unanswered prayers, the defeat, the death, the divorce, the comeback, the story of the bruised but still shimmering faith, all told as truth among a people and carried collectively. This is good and not something we push away from. We lean into it, in fact. We lean all the way. But Hooks also says words and their definitions are important. A good definition, she says, marks our starting point and lets us know where we want to end up. So what is healing? 
In Luke's gospel, healing is an integral part of God's plan of redemption for the world. It is a sign that God is at work. It is a broadly defined term that includes more than physical manifestation of relief from disease. Healing includes other dimensions, a transformation from spiritually broken to whole. Jesus' power is connected always to God and as such points to God's saving plan and purpose. In Luke's gospel, we can't help but read some of this action as complete eradication of disease. And I want to see some of that. I want to see and believe for it. But what is most needed, what is most important, I have to land on healing, a more expansive, more imaginative way of seeing and understanding healing. In healing, we learn to live into a sacred relationship with God and ourselves, ourselves and others, and to use that wisdom, that teaching, as we transform the little pieces of the world we inhabit. Well, that's the dream anyway. The legacy of healing and miracles is etched deeply in the Christian church. It is a theme woven in and throughout scripture. Our sacred text tells us of Jesus, who is not a magician, but a divine healer and miracle worker. And because this is so, it is in everything. It is in our liturgy and our sacred art. It is part of our story, but we don't talk about it enough. We're most comfortable with healing as the direct manifestation of wellness from a particular disease. And since this is not something we can control, we've all but given up on it given up on the potential for it to be something we can hope for or experience. So let's just name the fear now. What if what we hope for never happens? Let's go there. We are afraid to believe because we don't think we'll get the miracle we hope for and that our prayers for healing amount to nothing, the untamed dreams of foolish believers, but our struggles, are an opportunity to see a new way. And our prayers usher us into God's circle of promise and possibility, and that circle is both bigger and wider than we imagined. And it absolutely involves risk. Here we speak of a deeper healing, a healing of the mind and soul, and that is different. And acknowledging that demands we press into a more expansive definition of the healing experience, which takes time. Over time, healing could mean the strengthening and restoration of our relationship with God and each other. It might mean we grow to know and love ourselves and others more deeply as beloved of God. It might mean we learn to pray through our suffering or simply grow in faith which in itself is a witness to the larger community of believers. Sometimes healing looks like the telling of a radical truth. This points to an essential distinction between curing an illness and healing the whole person. We now understand humans as not simply dualistic body and spirit, right? We are psycho, social, somatic, spiritual beings for whom healing encompasses social, emotional, and mental healing as much as physical and spiritual. Our prayer life and language have expanded because of this acknowledgement. It is good and it is important. An example of that might be our live stream chat, which became a place for our individual prayers during the pandemic and their glorious specificity opened up the topic of healing for us, I believe, in new ways. Our prayers changed, and I imagine we're all thinking about healing in more dynamic ways. Healing is part of this mystery. For the parts of it, the places we can see and understand it, oh God, we give thanks. But it is still a mystery, one well beyond our understanding. It encompasses things we cannot yet see. It is full of mystery, courage, hope, and love, and much of it remains unwritten and is as at, 
and is as yet unfinished. Healing is bigger and our individual stories of suffering are openings to new ways of seeing ourselves and each other as teachers determined to contribute our holy labor to the dream of restoring the world. I cannot, however, put what I have personally experienced and witnessed behind me. I bring these stories to you and pray you can add them to your own. The stories that tell of encounter with this power and a Jesus that through the power of God heals. Jesus seems to know that the people's pain, their present trouble and struggle must be addressed. And he meets their needs in this text with this therapeutic, restorative, health and life-giving power. A power that is happening in the moment and into the future. And I don't want us to give up on that. It feels like we're leaving something really significant behind if we do. Our healings, even our blessings, the old folks say, are never for us alone. Our healing shapes the world around us so we get to learn from each other's wisdom, each other's sacred communication with God through suffering. At the core of healing is a blessing, our being named or identified as a, ch a child of God, accepted as and with the deepest sense of knowing tethered to our belovedness in Jesus. Our knowing that we are created for community and that we come from love. A love we can live into and enjoy right now and to which we will all return in every way whole. We are bearers of hope in crisis, in the midst of pain and suffering we believe, in all times have faith, and if we must lose or end a battle sooner than we expect, we do so in a blaze of God glory with hope. We remain open to the possibility of all that healing can mean for the curing and healing from illness and for the hope of health for the whole person. The people come to hear and be healed. May the same be said of us. I'll close today with a reading of a poem by Jan Richardson, whose painting Made Well is on the cover up of our bulletin this week. I'll read her poem. It's called The Healing That Comes and we'll end with a moment of quiet reflection where we can bring our own expectations our hopes and dreams, our questions about healing to God. The healing that comes. I know how long you've been waiting for your story to take a different turn. How far have you gone in search of what will mend you and make you whole? I bear no remedy, no cure, no miracle for the easing of your pain. But I know the medicine that lives in a story that has been broken wide open. I know the healing that comes in ceasing to hide ourselves away with fingers clutched around the fragments we think are none but ours. See how they fit together, these shards we've been carrying. How in their meeting, they make a way we could not find alone. Just bow your hearts. Bow your hearts with me. Consider your own experience of healing. How has Jesus met you? How have you felt alone? Bring your questions. Bring your doubts. Bring your hope. Bring your hope.
in the end may it be said of you that you came that you believed that you gave God a try that you stood strong that you shared your pain your struggle your disappointment with the people who loved you the people God gave you to love you be here just a moment just a moment offer thanks for healing that you've already received pray for healing that you know and believe will come in some form pray for eyes to see pray for eyes to see the expansive the expansive way of healing it is bigger more multi-dimensional we can't even imagine it but be open to it I know my words are not the final end, end all and be all on healing. It is such an expansive topic. But I pray today we've opened up a conversation with ourselves and with God. And that in this season and always going forward, we walk into something new a new season of expectation. I'll be walking right beside you. Amen. <laughs>